Main segment brought to you by PTED Magazine. Today's training segment is going to take a brief look at hybrid vehicle battery failure diagnosis. In our training segment today, we're going to go over a few different things. We're going to start by looking at some of the basic failure types that can happen within these battery packs. The ones that we'll go over are going to be imbalances in both power and energy. We'll look at something called apparent capacity loss, also referred to as ACL. Then we're going to look at some of the different failure modes of the cells themselves, where we can have high resistance, shorts, open circuits, an increased self-discharge rate, and even electrolyte loss that can all impact the performance of this battery pack. So let's start with a battery imbalance. This is one of the more common codes that you may see if you actually have a malfunction indicator warning light on caused by a hybrid battery failure. This is something that occurs when the battery modules can't absorb energy or they can't deliver energy at equal rate. That can be either a power imbalance or an energy imbalance. Because the pack is wired in series, as we discussed in one of our previous segments, the entire pack is limited by the weakest module. And because of that, the battery has to monitor all of those modules to ensure that they're performing at a very similar level. If they aren't, the entire battery pack has to be limited to prevent any overcharge or over discharge of any given module within that pack assembly. Apparent capacity loss is something that's a little bit less understood than some of the other failure modes of the battery packs. Apparent capacity loss is caused by a shallow cycling of the battery, which is normal operation within a hybrid vehicle. This is because the battery typically lives somewhere between a 50% state of charge and a 70% state of charge almost all the time during normal vehicle operation. That means it's only cycling through about 20% of its rated capacity. They never take them all the way up to 100% within the vehicle on a regular hybrid because it's simply impractical and causes the battery to get relatively hot. It's just not an efficient way to operate it and it shortens the cycle life of the battery pack. What ends up happening with this reduced capacity is that we start to lose the ability of that battery to assist our engine as much. And obviously if we lose battery capacity and we have to use the engine more, we start to lose fuel economy. So this apparent capacity loss can affect us in a few different ways. One, it can affect the performance of the vehicle, where it can no longer deliver enough power to accelerate the way that it once did. And two, it can actually cause the engine to work more, which will obviously then lower our fuel economy and increase the emissions that the vehicle is putting out. Now, if you look at the chart, this is explaining the apparent capacity loss because there's some misunderstanding within the, the industry about what actually is needed by the battery or how the battery delivers its energy to the vehicle. The battery uses in the neighborhood of 50 to 70 percent of the battery pack's current rated capacity. Now when this battery is new, if it was for instance a six hour battery pack, then it will be utilizing somewhere between that 50 percent and 70 percent range. So that 20 percent normal operating window would be of that six amp hour rating of that battery pack. What happens with apparent capacity loss is the battery no longer behaves as a six amp hour battery. If it starts to lose energy, it starts to act more like say a 4 amp hour battery or 4.5 amp hour battery. What that does is it's still only going to allow the battery to be utilized within that 50 to 70 percent range. However now the 50 to 70 percent range is no longer of a 6 amp hour battery, it's of the smaller battery that this is now behaving like. What that does then is it reduces the amount of amp hours that's available to this vehicle to use in that narrow operating state of charge range that these vehicles like to operate in. The misunderstanding within the industry is that because the battery only uses on average 60% of its rated capacity, the battery could lose 40% of its rated capacity before the vehicle has any impact on its performance. And that simply isn't the case because it's not how the battery is utilized within the vehicle. The battery has to be monitored by the vehicle to estimate its state of charge. And when the battery starts to behave as a smaller battery pack, it goes through those state of charge swings faster. And you'll see that on the gauge on the dash as it goes up and down much more rapidly than it did when it was a new battery pack with the vehicle performing the way it should. All right, let's take a look at some of the cell failure types that can occur within these batteries. The first one that we'll look at is high resistance. High resistance is simply going to be something within that battery cell that's causing it to no longer be able to deliver enough current when it's under load compared to what it was initially capable of doing. A high resistance problem can be caused by things like internal cell oxidation, which actually can be the result of over discharge on these battery packs. 
And unfortunately, that's even occurring during some of the, the service methods and diagnostic methods that are being promoted within the industry that we'll talk about later. Another failure method is shorts. This is where we have a perforation between the anode and cathode separator plate. So if you think of how a battery is designed, we have a positive and a negative plate within that battery pack. There's a separator that keeps those two from coming in contact with each other. If that separator becomes perforated or it has a, a hole in it, then we start to have a short where we have a very low resistance path for the current to move within the cell itself rather than exiting the cell to go from the positive terminal to the negative terminal. This can be caused by several different things such as cell structure changes and dendrite growth within those cells. An open circuit is obviously something where we no longer have the capability to flow current from a particular battery cell or within a module assembly. That open circuit can be caused by numerous different things within that battery cell, but the bottom line is an open circuit is an unrepairable event within a battery module or cell. We have a, something called the increased self-discharge rate. If you're familiar with nickel metal hydride batteries in general, nickel metal hydride has a very high self-discharge rate to begin with. What can happen over time is we have some internal cell structure changes that starts to apply pressure to that separator plate between the positive and negative electrodes. What starts to happen is that self-discharge rate can increase. If we have a self-discharge rate increase on some modules more than it does on other modules, what this will result in is an imbalanced battery pack because as the vehicle sits overnight or even worse for extended periods of time, say in operation, uh, not being operated for a week or so while someone's on vacation, that module with the higher self-discharge rate will drop much lower than the rest of the pack and that can then cause it to trigger an imbalance code within that battery. And the last one is electrolyte leakage. An electrolyte leakage is pretty self-explanatory. Some of these batteries have a vent on them. The vent is not designed to open under normal operation. However, it can open if the cell gets too much pressure inside. If we start to have a vent that opens up and doesn't reseal properly, we will then have electrolyte loss. We can also have seepage of that electrolyte out around the positive and negative terminals, or if we have a crack within that battery assembly in some way, shape, or form that allows that electrolyte to leak out. Obviously, if we don't have as much electrolyte left in the cells, the cells can't produce as much energy because they no longer have as much electrolyte in contact with active material within that cell and that cell becomes permanently limited. Now that we've taken a brief look at the failure modes that can occur within the hybrid batteries, let's take a look at the diagnostic options that are available in order to actually pinpoint the cause of the malfunction indicator light caused by one of these battery failures. The first category that we'll look at are things called onboard diagnostics. This will revolve around scan tool and DLC-based diagnostic equipment, even the stuff that's specialized for hybrid battery testing. Then we'll look at some of the off-board methods, both the good methods as well as some of the inaccurate methods that are being promoted within the industry. All right, let's discuss the onboard test methods for looking at hybrid battery codes and the failures that cause them. The first one we'll look at is the scan tool. Obviously, the scan tool is a great starting point anytime you have a malfunction indicator light on. The problem with the scan tool as a diagnostic tool as a whole is it's limited to gross failure analysis. It's not designed for pinpoint testing of any individual components. It's simply designed to help give us a starting point to do that final analysis to figure out where the root cause of the problem really is. Unfortunately, it also does not provide us any way to check the overall health of this battery pack. The scan tool really is designed to help us find anything that would cause an imbalance within that battery pack and the imbalance has to be pretty gross in order for it to actually trigger a code and show up on the scan data. You'll notice the scan data on the right side of the screen here. You can see that we have some traces that are low. This is a gross failed battery that's obviously showing three bad modules. What it doesn't show, however, is that the rest of the modules in that pack, when they're actually tested for complete energy capability, we're only at about 20% of the rated capacity of this battery pack. There are three that are much worse, but the rest of the battery pack was also in very poor condition, and that simply isn't something that's readily available through scan data. The other tools that are out there that are an onboard diagnostic tool are specialized tools that are designed to be plugged into the, the DLC in order to analyze that battery pack. Keep in mind that we're just plugging into the DLC, which means the data that that tool is using is going to be the exact same data that your scan tool has access to. That means all the tool is really doing is taking that data and it's analyzing that data for you. Unfortunately, that means it can't take into account for anything such as a poor wire connection, 
and it, it can't do any other testing than what the vehicle is capable of doing through a normal drive cycle simply because it's not actually able to remove the battery from the vehicle and run it through a full cycle to determine what its actual energy and power capabilities are. So again, this is generally going to be suffering from very similar limitations to what the scan tool does because it's relying on the exact same data. Before we talk about off-board testing, I want to make sure that we address a couple of issues that are happening within the industry, and it's populated in the internet a lot over the last several years. And that's inaccurate methods of testing hybrid batteries and even repairing the hybrid batteries. The problem with these methods is they aren't following any of the battery standards. These are things that are being developed by hobbyists or, or well-meaning technicians. However, they aren't following the standards, which means they may actually end up damaging the battery and they generally are not going to produce repeatable results, and they don't provide any sort of documentation that you can give the customer. These internet-based methods, as we call them, simply don't provide a professional level experience or any real usable data that you can trust to analyze the condition of this battery pack. If the end result is simply we want the light off, but we don't care about what the overall condition of the battery pack is, then some of these methods will get you out the door and have the light stay off, at least initially. However, what it doesn't do is provide you with some sort of an actual documentable repair that you can feel good about and understand what the actual capabilities of a battery are compared to when it was brand new. So what makes up a good off-board test for a hybrid battery? Well, the bottom line is there are a few minimum standards that it must meet. It needs to follow battery testing standards. Those standards are going to be power testing and energy testing of that battery pack. For hybrid vehicles, there's something called HPPC, or a Hybrid Pulse Power Characterization Test, that's supposed to be done to ensure that that battery can deliver high amounts of current for short periods of time and deliver it equally throughout the entire battery pack, because remember, these are wired in series. The other test is something called an energy test. The energy test is going to allow us to compare what amount of energy this battery can store, so that then we can see how good this battery is compared to where it started when it was brand new. In other words, if this was a six and a half amp hour battery pack like a Toyota Prius, is it currently performing or capable of performing as a 6.4 amp hour battery pack? Or is it currently only capable of performing as a two amp hour battery pack? Because it may be balanced and it may not turn the light on, but that doesn't mean it's good because it can be a very equally balanced, poor energy pack and still keep the light off in many of these vehicles. The other thing that you need to keep in mind whenever you look at any type of off-board testing is the results should be both documentable and repeatable. In other words, you need to have some sort of a documentation showing what the results were from that test so you compare it to what the initial battery specifications were. That way you know how good this battery really is compared to when it was brand new and drove off the dealer lot. The other thing that it needs to have is the capability of being repeatable so that we know if we were to test this battery two or three times, that the results are going to be very consistent because that proves that the test process being utilized is actually an accurate test so that we know that the results that we're comparing against the original factory ratings are in fact accurate. Now if you'll notice there's some, some captures on the screen here of some data that was captured and there is also a thermal image of the battery pack during a charge process. In other words, to do this stuff you're going to have to have some specialized equipment. It is something that's definitely doable in the repair facility, but it does require specialized equipment and it does require specialized training. What we just went through was just a very quick and very brief overview of hybrid bat battery diagnostics. We didn't even touch on what type of repairs are available or really too in depth on how the off-board testing works. If you would like some more information on either of those, by all means visit our website which is shown on the screen here. There are some other videos up there as well as some other links that may be a benefit if you want to learn more about this technology and how, what can and can't be done on these vehicles. Thank you for watching this technical training segment brought to you by P10 Magazine. Hopefully you found it a benefit and will join us for another one in the future.